So uh, many of you probably know that there's an effort that's been going on jointly between the network management and operations area in areas in the IETF uh, to try and come back to a kind of convergence. Um, there's been this separation over the last uh, 10 years where they've been, <coughs> excuse me, the network management people have been doing um, these great SNMP version 3 with cryptographic security tools and the operation people, operations people have been using command line. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. And the answer is not to retrain all of the operators, since the operators are doing what they're doing for reasons. Um, the answer is probably to find out what exactly it is that operators need, whether command line is it, whether an enhanced command line of some sort is it, whether a command line with some kinds of, of augmentation and so forth. So <clears throat> we've got this, um, this draft, Operator Requirements and Infra Infrastructure Management Methods, uh, which is attempting to just catalog what it is that operators are looking for. So we're basically doing a little road show and running around to Nanogs and Apricots and Ripes and I'm going to be going to Lisa in the beginning of December and uh, trying to get feedback from operators on the draft. So the draft itself can, of course, be found in the IETF drafts directory. Um, uh, ops operator requirements uh, draft one. Um, actually, let's see. I think we're one going on two now. Um, so I just want to run through the kind of open issues, the issues that seem like they're still kind of hot topics that we particularly need uh, input on. So consensus has basically been reached that what we're looking for is a command line interface, but one that's a little bit more SMTP-like, right? So in SMTP, you have a transaction where it's on the one hand, human understandable if you go and you type it. On the other hand, uh, it's very easy to automate. Part of the reason it's easy to automate is because it's got numeric result codes and the text of the result code is, from the machine's point of view, a comment that it can pass on to a user if it needs to. Uh, but the code can operate completely from the numeric return codes at the beginning. Um, so the question is, do we all want our routers spitting back little numeric result codes at us at the beginning of things that they say to us? Um, some people think, ugh, that would be ugly. I want pretty ASCII. Uh, other people say, pretty ASCII is ugly. I want numbers. So there's a little bit of a fight there. Um, need input from you guys. Uh, and we can have questions after this, um, suggestions, etc. The best way, though, is to email me. Okay, auto configuration, and this brings up, there, there are a bunch of things that will touch on this same sort of little problem area. So auto configuration is when you take a new device out of the box, right? It's just come from the manufacturer, you plug it in, you plug it into the network, does it try to do anything? Does it try to configure itself a little bit so that you can get to it remotely? Or does it sit there inert until you plug in on the console port give it a password, you know, give it IP addresses, so, and so forth. <clears throat> the way a lot of people seem to be distinguishing this, um, and I think I am one of those people, so I may be a little biased, is this is a draft about operator requirements. An operator is a professional configurator of devices. Configurer, yeah, configurator, whatever, something. Somebody who configures devices for a living. Um, things that configure themselves are, by definition, not things that a professional configures. Therefore, they're out of scope of this document. This is kind of a semantic distinction I'm making, and that may be a little too tricky or goofy or something. I'm not sure. But on the other hand, it may be useful. Um, there are a lot of people who do big core routers who say, you know, 
anything that this thing does that I didn't tell it to do is a security problem and it is, you know, stuff I have to go in and correct. So we don't want them doing anything. Now, on the other hand, there are, you know, cable modems and stuff like that where they need to be able to come from the manufacturer directly to the end user, be plugged in and come up and work without anyone ever touching them. Um, so the argument is maybe that an operator requirements graph doesn't need to touch on things that don't need to be touched by operators. But that's open to argument as well. So in the IETF, we do RFCs, and RFCs talk about protocol on the wire. Um, whether something has a serial port and what the serial port looks like is not protocol on the wire. So there's a bit of a question as to whether we can get away with saying in the documents that one of operators' requirements is that everything have a console port, a craft access port, and much less whether we can get away with saying it needs to be RJ45 with specific pinouts so that we only have to carry one cable and no adapters. Um, nevertheless, that seems to be something that operators feel strongly about. So I think where we are on this is that we're going to try to get it in and see if anybody shoots it down. Um, this brings up the same issue of can we write a document in the IETF that says you have to have a certain port on a device and then do the cable modem guys get uptight because putting that port on would cost $10 on their $25 device or whatever. Um, so sort of the same issue as before. Uh, and again, that same issue comes up when we talk about HTML forms as a means of configuring a device. Um, professional operators seem to be pretty much in agreement that they never want to see any HTML out of their core router. On the other hand, um, we uh, have a lot of sort of cable modem whatever folks who say, well, nobody's ever going to touch this using a command line. Uh, if we're ever going to get anything out of the user, it has to be through a browser. Um, so, same thing. Um, do we say HTML forms are explicitly not how we want to see our routers configured, or do we not address the issue, or do we say this is not how you do a core router? <clears throat> All right. One of, the, one of the main requirements that we have good consensus on is that you need to be able to export the complete configuration of a device in one file. That is, you need to be able to get an ASCII text file out of a device which you can read into another device and have a clone of the first device or, you know, back it up or restore it or whatever. Um, the question then is private keys. If a device contains a private key, should you be able to export the private key as easily as you export, say, interface configuration? Um, if you don't and you're trying to restore something in an emergency, you've got a problem. If you do, you've got a security issue. So I and many people, I think, can see both sides of that. We just need to have good arguments on each side and hammer something out. I don't think there's any animosity in this one. I think it's just everybody sees both sides of it. Comment preservation. Um, Right now, you can comment a configuration, drop it into a router, and many routers will strip almost every comment you put in. Um, and then you don't get the comments back out again. Uh, vendors are getting better and better about that over time, but it's still not perfect by any means. Um, operators seem to feel like um, there's no reason that anything they type in should ever be discarded gratuitously by the vendor. Um, vendors keep coming back and saying, but if we kept everything you typed, your configurations would be really long. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Nobody's figured out quite, quite why there's a disagreement on this list. Um, change commit time. Um, there's a distinction between line-by-line -line commit, where every time you hit a carriage return as you're entering a configuration, um, that last line of configuration immediately is committed to operational status. That is, it goes into effect if your last line was, um, you know, 
interface, the one I'm logging in through, shut down, then you're not going to be typing anything on the next line. Um, is that okay? Um, some people like it that way. Other people like to be able to type their entire config, including the part that would allow them to get in on a different interface, and then commit. Um, so should the device manufacturer determine which way to do commits based upon which way the user is, the, the operator is entering the data. That is, if the operator has TFTP'd a, a new config into the device, do it as a batch. If the operator is typing line by line, do it line by line. Um, maybe there's argument on this too. It's kind of two camps, two people like it different ways, vendors like it different ways. It seems like maybe everybody's going to wind up having to support both. Um, but, you know, everybody's opened a little argument on that. <clears throat> delayed commit. Delayed commit means you create a config snippet that is a few lines of config, not a whole configuration, uh, which maybe just affect a small part of the router. And you say, put this into effect at midnight local time. Um, the problem with doing this is that this is effectively doing the same thing as allowing multiple users to touch the box at the same time. That is, giving simultaneous write access to, to multiple parties. Because if you have a snippet which goes into effect in an hour, and in a half hour somebody else comes along and changes a bunch of stuff out from under what you were expecting that snippet to apply to, you've essentially got the overlapping rights problem, right? Because your snippet, obviously, is trying to affect a change based upon one state, and that state no longer applies when the snippet is committed. So <clears throat> in the draft, basically what we say is, this is a really hairy problem. We think you should think really carefully before you do anything in this area, and then we don't give any advice about it. Um, that's basically where I'm at on that still. If anybody has any useful advice to give to vendors on this, we'd like to hear it. Um, okay, so then we have this sort of last big issue of <clears throat> do people really need different output for machine parsing than they need for human parsing? Or is that just habit that people continue to ask for that? Um, is it, or is this like the sort of AADA issue where, <clears throat> you know, curb cuts are better for everybody, not just folks with wheelchairs, and better lighting is better for everybody, not just people, you know, who can't see as well? Um, my theory, I think, is that better designed UI is better for everybody, whether they're reading it as a person or reading it in code. Um, there are other folks who think that there really needs to be a distinction. Um, if there's a distinction, everybody is agreed that the branch should be as late as possible so that the two modes don't drift apart and so that the smallest possible amount of code needs to be written to generate the output. Um, <clears throat> What this may come down to is just XML style everything on its own line for machine parsing versus tabular like show IP BGP sum style output for visual parsing. Um, if that's really the only difference and you can get the same data either way, exactly the same data either way, and it just comes out taller and skinnier if you asked for it line by line, probably nobody has any objections to that. So we're trying to figure out if that represents consensus. Um, I think this is the last one. Uh, divergent AAA is if you've got a command line and you've got SNMP, uh, we've, right now we've got completely different authentication and authorization modes for those, right, that may be hitting completely different AAA backends, um, you know, may have different concepts of what a user is. Uh, 
is that okay? Um, most people don't like that, but SNMP is is here. Nobody's suggesting that we get rid of it. Um, there's no obvious solution to this either, other than saying it's a bad idea going forward and nobody should create any new modes. Um, the SNMP folks are interested as well. Bert is pushing on them to try to sort of come into line with the same authentication modes that people are starting to use on, on routers for remote authentication authorization and so forth. Um, obviously, if you want to help, the first thing you need to do is read the draft in its entirety so that you know what the issues are. Um, Suzanne, Steve Feldman, and I are the relevant contacts on this. Um, the area directors, of course, are Bert Wyman and Randy Bush. Um, so that is it for this one. Questions? Phil. Switch on the top, Phil. There you go. Um, I know a lot of the network management guys would probably stand up and say, you can do a lot of the things that you'd be talking about doing with the command line interface or a GUI or whatever you want by having the SNMP underlying layers say exactly how they are. And I'm, I'm curious what your response to that is. One of the things we seem to have reached a consensus on is that SNMP MIBs represent a huge investment of labor and that that labor was well done in the IETF with consensus among the parties involved at the time and that there is no reason to even think about discarding that. That probably the best way to deal with that is something like a MIB browser built into the router itself so that from the command line on the serial port of the router you can get at MIB data. Um, that answer the question? Okay. I mean, it sounds like an awful lot of what you're talking about is more of a user interface issue. Yes. The is SNMP gets, the SNMP sets can get you whatever instrumentation that you want and, and perform actions on the router through SNMP sets and so forth. That really you're talking more about the um, sort of a middleware piece that would be more the way that the operators think, more the way the operators do their daily configurations and modifications and such. Yeah, that's certainly <clears throat> that's certainly one way of putting it that I think a lot of people would agree with. Um, to make it really clear, with the exception of things like we do need a serial port, uh, no one is trying to dictate how devices should work. All we're trying to do is make uniform how operators interoperate with the devices. Right? We're, we're not saying the internals of the device should be thus and such. All we're saying is when we have to type into the device, we want it to recognize the same commands, whether it's a Cisco or a Juniper or some little bitty thing. Um, we want it to spit back the answer to the question, show interface Ethernet zero or whatever, in the same format, regardless of what vendor it is. When vendors have <clears throat> vendor specific features that are the unique value that that vendor provides, obviously that can't be made uniform with somebody who doesn't have that feature and nobody's trying to dictate that, right? All we're saying is that where there is unambiguous feature overlap, we want it to work the same and we want it to work in this kind of simple CLI manner. Yes? I have two questions. Mike McFade and Riverstone. When you say that you can copy a config off a box and then take it and put it on another box, what kind of assumptions are you making there? Because as far as I know, when you try to do that, if those boxes aren't the same or aren't possibly running even the same firmware, it doesn't work. And the second question is, if we're going to have a CLI, do you think it should be standardized? Um, should there be a, uh, a form that's generic, uh, or do you think it's good to continue to develop uh, CLIs of different styles and just figure out some um, maybe standard language to kind of okay. the two. So to, to address those in, in order, um, I don't think, again, anybody's trying to dictate to vendors what they should do in the event that they, well, obviously if we get an error back because we've tried to address an interface that doesn't exist on that box, 
we want the error to be the same regardless of whether it's a cyst or a juniper or some little dinky thing. Okay. Um, but we're not expecting to not see an error and have an interface magically appear, else we'd be typing, you know, uh, show OC48, blah, 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 a lot. Well, but you raise the interface is here. I would say there's a distinction then between uh, what the telco guys like, where they have a concept of pre provisioning, and where the datacom guys said the interface isn't there, you can't put it in there unless you, of course, copy and config that okay. has an unreference. Ah, okay, all right, that's what you're saying. Um, one thing that has been discussed is the question of whether the naming the interface type as well as its position within the box is gratuitous or not. That is, should an interface be interface 1 slash 0 slash 2 dot 1 or whatever, or should it be interface ethernet 1 slash 0 slash 2 dot 1? And some people, a lot of people, I think, think that the word Ethernet there is gratuitous. Um, and I think folks seem to be leaning towards making that input optional, output, uh, probably, you probably keep it in the output. Would I um, assume that you like the command define interface range foo interface yes, one yes, to five, blah, 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 and use that throughout your show and config command? Yes, uh, there's a lot of stuff in here about uh, ranges and lists and templates and uh, uh, settable defaults and so forth. Uh, to answer your question, probably the part of the document you want to be looking at is the part about uh, settable defaults where you say for any new board of type foo, interface of type foo that goes in, uh, here's what we want it to look like. Um, that sort of addresses what you're talking about. Uh, question two was uh, wait, sorry, do question or two again? Simply, is there a, uh, you know, a standard uh, format for presenting the information such that maybe you know, there was a, either a form or a, an ITF effort to say, here's kind of yeah. like what the features are. One of the things that I run into a lot. Wait, wait, not features, representation. Yes, thank you. Right. Um, I was in the IDR working group meeting uh, the last ITF, and someone got up to present the MIB, Jeff Hoffman actually. And uh, a lot of the guys walked out of the room, you know, hoo -hoo. No, that's, yeah. that's not worth doing. I just want to remind the community that a management plane just defines the object that you tweak, not necessarily the representation of how a vendor is going to provide it. And uh, it would be nice, of course, if the vendors would do what the standard says, but right. uh, that remains an issue. Where things seem to be going is that there needs to be pressure upon vendors to make the UI representation uniform where they actually have overlap, but there should be no pressure at all upon them to create overlap, right? We're not looking for vendors to be more uniform in what they do. We're only looking for them to represent it in a uniform way where there is, in fact, identical functionality. Yes, sir, back. Jeff Ackner from Cooper Union University. Uh, I think most of the things in this document are darn good ideas, and most of them can be implemented in software, which is good news because you have a chance of the vendors actually complying with the standard. The only thing I, I find objectionable or, or curious is, what's the obsession with um, using an RJ45 as a serial pinout and, and trying to dictate a standard when there have been, um, I don't know, how many permutations of eight are there uh, already <laughs> out there as, uh, as standards pre-existing? What's wrong with, say, a DB9? Uh, it's more expensive. It, but it's there. It's already on a lot of devices. But many fewer than on, um, well, I don't know. I mean, do I bring it up on the list? Take another vote? Uh, I mean, th there seems to be consensus. Sorry. There seems to be very rough consensus mm -hmm. that if we require a serial port, that it be the same as what Cisco and Sun do. Um, because that's at least two vendors who have the same pinouts and so forth. Obviously, the DB9 stuff is already uniform. The problem is that uh, DB9 interfaces are a lot more fragile and a lot more expensive and bulkier. And if we want, if we are going to try and require anything of vendors, we want the requirement to be as lightweight as possible. Okay. 
Any other questions on this one, or shall I go ahead to the next talk? Okay. <laughs>